Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are in the country. My name is Erfan Ibrahim. I am the founder and CEO of the Bid Bazaar LLC, and we are coming to you live. Um, I am in Denver, Colorado, and I believe Tony is out in Florida today. Uh, we are launching our um, DBB Resist webinar series. Uh, RESIST stands for Resilient Energy Systems Information Sharing Town Hall. And as part of this webinar series, we are hosting a set of presentations from the Energy Blockchain Consortium. And we are going to provide you a very unique perspective into the concept of blockchain as it pertains to the energy sector. You are hearing about blockchain in general terms out there, and there seems to be a lot of hype as well as confusion about what it is, what its potential is. So to make sense of all of that, we have Tony Girotti from the Energy Blockchain Consortium today, who is going to get into the concept of blockchain and then through subsequent presentations, get into the applications or possible applications of blockchain in the energy sector. So, Tony, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Irfan, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for attending this webinar live uh, uh, from all over the world. Uh, today's uh, topic is uh, introduction to blockchain with focus on energy. Uh, my name is uh, Tony Giroti, and uh, I will be actually presenting today. Um, and if you have any questions after the webinar, you can email me. So just a, a quick word about myself, about 25 years of IT experience with a bachelor's and master's in electrical and computer engineering. <clears throat> uh, I've been actually doing uh, developing distributed computing platforms uh, for a number of years now. And I've also developed some high availability transaction processing applications. And at some point in my life, I also did uh, design of some fault tolerant, uh, massively scalable uh, supercomputers. <clears throat> I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Um, I spent the last 12 years in the energy and the smart grid space and, uh, and now in the energy uh, blockchain space. <clears throat> I've also been around the block uh, with, uh, 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 in, the, in the council with the US DOE and, and Gridwise Architecture Council and NIST. Uh, I'm currently, I'm the chairman of the Energy Blockchain Consortium. So thank you for attending the webinar again. Uh, to begin with, just a quick disclaimer, any product or individual or company we mention in this webinar is purely coincidental. Uh, we avoid the use of any names. Uh, so nothing we mention in this webinar uh, illustrates uh, our endorsement of any kind. All right. So uh, a quick word on the Energy Blockchain webinar series. <clears throat> the series was created by the Energy Blockchain Consortium. Um, it's free to anyone registering, and you have the link there. Um, it's a series of 12 webinars around the energy and the blockchain space. Uh, they will be held on first Friday of every month at 12 o'clock. The first one is right now, today. And they're also available for offline viewing. <clears throat> and uh, the Energy Blockchain Consortium, just a quick word, is it's a nonprofit consortium of companies which are interested in the use of blockchain technology to solving the most compelling problems in the energy industry. And we welcome you to join the consortium and you have the links and my email uh, should you have any and need more information or have any questions. Okay, so let's get started. How blockchain actually started, <laughs> we'll talk about that. We'll talk about bitcoins. Uh, everybody knows about bitcoins. Uh, and then what is actually blockchain? We'll get into that. And how does it work? Uh, I will not be too technical. I'll be conceptually giving you the idea of how it works with an example, <clears throat> which is very, very difficult to find because everything goes into the detail. The concepts are sort of important. We'll also talk about what the hype is all about. And then we'll switch gears and talk about the energy blockchain. And I've heard this question before, uh, is there any danger in using blockchain? We'll address that. Uh, we'll also talk about some practical uses of blockchain in the energy industry. And I do have an example for that as well. And then we'll talk about 
the potential of blockchain in the energy industry. And then we'll wrap it up with a few next steps. All right. So let's start with the basically uh, what how it all started. So uh, there was a great recession that we know of, of the 2000 and 2010, and the financial crisis of the 2007 and 2008, which started with the uh, subprime mortgage crisis in the United States, and uh, which led to the banking crisis, which eventually led to the collapse of uh, the bedrock financial institutions. <clears throat> And this led to a global economic downturn and, of course, the Great Recession. So while all of that was happening towards the tail end of that chapter, a pseudo name Satoshi Nakamoto actually created a Bitcoin paper. And uh, this pseudo name is we don't know if it's one person or a number of people that's unknown to us as of today. Uh, on August 18, Bitcoin.org was formed as a domain, and on January 3rd, 2009, the Bitcoin actually started. And the first pizza was bought on the 22nd of May, 2010, for about 10,000 Bitcoins, which in today's monetary value is about $75 million. So it started with that. Having said that, uh, I want to start by saying that blockchain and Bitcoin are not the same. A blockchain is actually a technology and Bitcoin is an application on that technology. And Bitcoin, as we all know, is a cryptocurrency. It's a digital currency we use to buy and sell products. Not all, but some. There's a fixed supply of 21 million Bitcoins and, and, and it's founded in the rarity of gold. And the blockchain and the cryptography is used to control its creation and management, which is a very unique thing. Um, a, a fiat currency, you might hear that, is actually a traditional currency that you and I carry in our wallet and use our credit cards with. It's the dollars and the euros, etc. So today, if you fast forward the world from 2007-2008, uh, blockchain can be used for tracking and buying and selling of any good or asset. Not just Bitcoin, but absolutely any good or asset. And the payments are actually not always necessary. The coin is important, but it's always not necessary to just process the payments. Um, also, it's called the DLT, the Digital Ledger Technology, and the technology itself actually provides the trust. And the unique thing is, because the technology itself provides a trust, intermediaries are actually not needed. So now let's talk about what is blockchain. Before I talk about blockchain and give you a, a theoretical meaning of blockchain, I think it's important to really understand what actually is blockchain based upon how we do things today and what blockchain will actually do. So let's start with the world today we live in. You know, we have companies, a bank, a utility, an insurance company. All of these companies today have a centralized control of the assets. So you can have a distributed computing environment for those who are uh, IT um, centric. You can have a lot of computers working on a lot of things. You can have supercomputers, but the control is centralized. So the data is owned by a company and the data is stored maybe in one or more databases. It's centralized. And the business logic is actually also centralized, whether it's on multiple computers or one computer, but it's centralized and the company runs the business logic. Similarly, the control is, is, resides with that company, whether it's a bank or a utility or an insurance company, they have the control of the data. So the trust, who do we trust? We actually trust the company. The company is a trusted party. We trust their decision making. We trust the historic data that they keep. We trust the changes that they make to the data and we trust the transactions. So that's how the world operates today. All right, the world of blockchain. The world of blockchain is very interesting. In the world of blockchain, it's actually the next generation of distributed computing environment. This has been happening for a number of years. Uh, the distributed computing concept started way back in 1985. So the concept itself is not unique. 
The blockchain actually is that next generation of distributed computing platform, nothing more. The interesting thing about this platform is that the control is actually distributed in multiple caretakers. It's a decentralized control. The nodes are connected through what is called as a peer-to-peer -peer network, but the control is decentralized. So what does that mean? What that means is that the data is in multiple databases. It's in so-called the distributed ledgers. So there's not one ledger, there's actually distributed ledgers. So as you can see the illustration, you have company A, B, C, and D. You've got four ledgers, they're all distributed, and each of them have a copy of the data. Company A is not in control, neither is company C. It's a distributed control. The business logic is similarly spread across these nodes. The business logic happens to be re reside in what is called as a smart contract. And if you think about it, the control actually is either with the company or with the users, you and I, us. So we can actually control our data as opposed to a single company on the left side controlling all the data. So who do we trust then? Who is the trusted party if it's not one company? It is actually those who are participating in this transaction. And I'll talk about that just in a few minutes because that's at the heart of blockchain. And that's why it's called trustless because we have to assume that we don't need to trust anybody. The technology will provide the trust. So therefore, there are four important components. The decision is actually the validation that occurs in the system automatically. That's the consensus. The historic data, as opposed to a company keeping it, is actually comes from the way we store the data through cryptography and some chains, and that's called provenance. The third is a very key attribute of blockchain, which is the data and the contract, which is the coding, is actually cannot be changed. It's called immutability. There are pros and cons to that. And the transactions, for those of you who are familiar with the distributed computing and uh, transaction processing, they know that when you actually process a transaction, there has to be a finality to it. And that finality is also coded into this blockchain. So these are the key attributes of the blockchain. It's a decentralized control model. So let's talk about, with an example, how it actually works. So I'm giving you an example where Andy sold three widgets to Bob, and the rate is $1 per widget. So in this particular case, Andy sold the widgets, and Bob is owed, Bob needs to send $3 to Andy. So we have a company A that has a blockchain. Blockchain has a smart contract, which actually codes this business logic, that the amount is equal to units into dollar amount. So we all basically use that as a first node for the transaction. So node A creates a digitally signed transaction that, hey, $3 uh, widgets from Andy to Bob, and X dollars will be sent from Bob to Andy. It's called transaction X, first transaction. That transaction actually then goes to the second node. So node B then basically says, wait a minute, I just got something. I need to do verification of that transaction. So it says, it does three things. It says, hey, does it comply with the blockchain rule? Is the digital signature okay? Or somebody is hacking into it? Is there any conflict with the previous transaction? So if it figures out that, hey, the actual transaction is valid, it puts it into a provisional, unconfirmed transaction pool. It's called the memory pool, it kind of keeps it. Keeps it for somebody to come in and say, aha, I validate that. But so far, the transaction is kept, which is Andy sold three widgets to Bob at the rate of $1. That transaction further propagates to the next node, and now you have a very similar thing where Node C does the same verification process because it has the, the logic to do it. Does it comply with blockchain rule? Is it digitally, uh, is, it, is digital signature okay? Are there any conflicts? And basically it does the same thing. It puts it into the memory pool. So now we have three nodes with the data in the memory pool. 
Then what happens? Then periodically, there are some validators who actually look into all these transactions and create blocks. A block is a, trans a set of transactions which are validated. The whole concept of validators is actually the most unique thing about blockchain, and I'll talk about that in the next couple of pages. But just for, the, for, this, for this diagram, this validator wakes up, figures out, and says, aha, I have to create a block. This block has the following information, four pieces of information. First, it's got a unique signature, which is the hash, which is a unique ID. It also knows who the, what the previous block was. So it has a link to the previous block. It has a timestamp. And then it says, okay, I'm gonna take all of these transactions together and I'll pool them together because they are a one, they are a single unit and I'm going to call it a block. And this block is actually stored. And the way you see it, this block is stored in the ledger C. Now what happens? This block actually gets propagated just like the way transaction was propagating in the four and the seven. The block gets propagated from node to node and it's linked as a chain and hence the blockchain. Okay, let's talk about one of the key innovations of blockchain, which is called a distributed trustless. Remember, trustless consensus. How do we validate that transaction? And how do we validate that block and create that block? Sorry. In the, in the good old times, it was a company that did that and their software that did that. In the future with the blockchain somebody has to do it and that's at the heart of the blockchain there are three established practices which i'll talk about today but there is a little bit more than this but i'll just keep it at this level there are three established practices by which these blocks are created one is called the proof of work this is the this is the foundational way in which consensus is created. Consensus means we all agree that this is the right block and we, the transactions in that block, which was Andy bought something, uh, sold something to Bob, those type of transactions need to be remembered, memorialized and contained. So that body of work needs to be done. We haven't done that yet. So the proof of work is one way to achieve that. Bitcoin works with, works with this proof of work. The way it works is that anyone with a computing power can actually solve a mathematical problem. That is very interesting. For those of us who are not familiar with the proof of work, we'll say, what is going on here? Why are we solving a mathematical problem? But they actually do solve a mathematical problem, whether it's an integer factorization or a guided tour of some protocol or a hash function, a reverse engineering, they actually solve a mathematical problem. And the winner is the leader who has brute force and power. And, and that leader is actually called the miner. So when you hear about this data mining or blockchain mining, it is that winner who has eventually won. And this leader, the winner, is actually the one who creates that block. Remember, the block is the one where you bring all of these transactions together and you validate them. So when, when this miner, this leader creates a block, others say, aha, you're the leader, we trust you. now." Let's verify it, trust but verify. And this leader, why would this leader actually do that? Why? Because this leader gets financially rewarded. Where does the money come from? Where does the money come from for this miner who actually does the validation of the transaction and the block? Where does it come from? It actually comes from the transaction itself. So when those when that one dollar was sent by bob to andy a micro part of that money is given to this miner in the good old days for that one dollar that was sent maybe 40 cents were kept by the intermediary think of what i'm saying right now in the good old days which is today when somebody does a transaction a portion of that transaction, let's say $1, is kept in the pocket of the intermediary. 
let's say 40 cents or 30 cents of a dollar. But in the new world with blockchain, the miner, the leader, the creator of the block takes a portion of that 30 cents. He or she does not take 30 cents. They probably take a very microcosm of that money, which means we have actually created a system that disintermediates and reduces the cost of transaction. Look at the beauty of it. I hope it makes sense. Now, interesting thing is people can cheat, right? Anybody can come and do the mining. It's very, very difficult to do the mining because you need raw computing power. Just to give you a sense, 32 terawatt hours of electricity is used per year to power Denmark. That's the power that you need to do the mining. What's the flaw here? There is a flaw. The flaw is that if you have over 51% of the resources, they can actually hijack the system. Okay. Let's not talk about the bad stuff now. Let's talk about the next thing, which is the proof of stake. Proof of stake as was actually created to solve that energy issue. Why should we be using that power equivalent of the 32 terawatt hours of power? Why can't we do it a more better way? That's called the proof of stake. The proof of stake is the way in which we bring the mining back into the chain. So rather than having these entities outside the blockchain making a decision and doing the mining and defining the block, now we brought the power back into the blockchain. So the stake of a user or the actor replaces the actual processing that we have to do to figure out who the leader is. So the leader of the block is chosen deterministically by the stake. So the minimum percentage of stake is required to participate. And in the proof of stake, there are different strategies in which the leader is identified. But the idea is that it's not mind bogglingly computing source intensive. It's based upon the proof of stake. All right, let's talk about the third one and the last one. Proof of authority. Proof of authority is actually a very, very sound approach that leverages a set of pre-approved accounts who are called validators, also called the authority nodes to do the leadership of creating those blocks. They actually earn the right. And when they earn the right, it's their responsibility to uphold high standards. Their reputation drives their mission. And the proof of authority and the proof of stake are the most popular in so-called the private blockchains, which I'll get to in a few minutes. The proof of work is more popular in a public blockchain more or less i'm talking about the 80 20 rule so all right there are things like the multi-signature process and the practical byzantine fault tolerance protocol which i won't get into right now but just kind of you should have at the back of your mind that there are other strategies and algorithms at play which are important as well but these three in front of you the pow pos and poa are basically driving the consensus the bft is actually a very interesting protocol that actually provides a lot of fault tolerance in a distributed computing environment, which I will get to if I have the time. All right, let's talk about the inner workings of a smart contract because smart contract is literally at the, at the heart of that consensus building. So the, this, is, this, is a, this is nothing more than a computer software which enforces a pre-negotiated contract in a distributed computing environment. The concept was envisioned by Nick uh, Zabo uh, in 1994. But those of us who are from an IT background, it's a transaction management protocol, like a two-phase commit that guarantees asset properties. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry, but it's a transaction management protocol, which means it manages the transaction. When Andy sold a widget to Bob, that is called a transaction. And that transaction, when you have hundreds and thousands of millions of them, spread over hundreds and thousands and maybe millions of computers it's a very very uh, difficult problem to solve so transaction management protocol provides that foundation in the blockchain to process that transaction so key points you don't need a third party because remember we're not dependent upon stakeholders we're dependent upon the technology the computer the software so each transaction is trackable and irreversible it's called immutable immutability is at the heart of blockchain uh, it provides security 
and it's superior to a traditional contract because it's all coded in the transaction and it's repeatable replicable across the entire ecosystem and it reduces the transaction cost remember i said it reduces the transaction cost. that one dollar that was paid by bob to andy as opposed to the 30 or the 40 cents going to an intermediary only let's say a one cent or 0.5 cents or less than that goes to the miner it reduces the transaction cost all of a sudden so andy as opposed to getting 60 cents or 50 cents for the for the widget he or she can actually get 98 cents 99 cents so think of the value okay so this there are some advanced topics which i can talk about just so you have a sense of the depth of the blockchain it's a very very well thought through technology a platform the custom logic has various degrees of so-called turing completeness what that means is that the smart contract that is the business logic in the blockchain has the ability to be coded using some new type of languages that makes it almost a brilliant way to code almost anything that's called turing completeness a turing is from the alan turing a very famous british cryptographer who basically reverse engineered the enigma machine it's based upon his machine concept the turing completeness is the way in which the smart contracts can be uh, implemented the bft algorithm is actually a very interesting algorithm that actually goes all the way back to the eastern roman empire uh, uh, in terms of the way they conducted their military exercises what it basically does in the world of blockchain is that it allows the blockchain to function day in and day out with the assumption that there will be faults and problems and break-ins into the system that level of fault tolerance is actually embedded and encoded in the blockchain so you as a user and i as a user should feel comfortable that no matter how the blockchain is functioning even if things fail it will continue to function that's the byzantine fault tolerance uh, based upon some military strategy uh, from the eastern roman empire you may want to read about that uh, so the smart contract is a very very uh, uh, interesting algorithm that is a combination of a lot of things it takes into fact there is replication going on in these hundreds of nodes it takes into fact that there is some cryptography happening in the chains it looks into the fact that i have to execute the business logic it has to think about the replication in the bft model it also has to make sure that all of these things come together within the auspices of a transaction management and all of that is encoded within the blockchain to execute a smart contract and a smart contract remember is that business logic that says if andy bought if andy sold three widgets to bob bob owes him three dollars and the widgets have to exchange hand that is the transaction okay so how does an application look like so in this particular case the way a blockchain application will look like is that you and i will define a business requirement which is an application that allows me to sell widgets at let's say one dollar per unit and the discount is 10 cent 10 percent over 10 units let's say that's my application simplistic but very clear i would encode is create a smart contract that says hey my rate is one dollar per unit i've got 10 percent discount for over 10 units here's my transaction so i will have transactions tx ty tz ta all of these transactions come together and what will happen is that all of these transactions get into a block some of them from company a some of them from company b some of them from company c so over the course of time i'm creating blocks one two three one two four one two five and these blocks are chained together and the transactions keep on accruing over time and everybody gets a copy of it and hence we have a blockchain and this is your actual application basically okay so now that i've said all of that let's talk about what is this hype all about what is going on the hype is as follows remember when you talk about decentralization of these nodes and computers what actually is happening think about it we are actually removing the monopolies because now one company is not in control 
you're actually removing monopolies. Can you even imagine what will happen if you remove the monopolies? That bullet alone is mind boggling. Fast forward the world and think of the ecosystem where you have less monopolies. Then think about if you have a decentralized system with the data replicated across these systems, who's gonna break that? Hundreds and thousands of computers. How can you break all of them together? You can't. So there's a multi-fold increase in security capability. It's game changing. Second, when we talk about disintermediation, remember I told you that $1? And 30 cents was going for the dis inter for the intermediary. Well, guess what? That overhead comes down significantly. We can actually almost disintermediate, or we can create the next generation of scaled intermediaries. Whether you are, you know, getting a car as a taxi, or you're ordering food or anything, you are the consumer. You decide what you want. And there will be a next generation of intermediaries who will, who, will, who, will, who will rise up, who will charge very little eventually because of blockchain. So the service is not compromised. Third, when we talk about democratization, it's huge because it's almost guaranteed that a minority will never hijack the value of the masses. A single person or a single entity will never be able to control the future of the masses. And there are so many instances around us every day in the news, but that's not the case. Can you even imagine what that, when that happens? And last but not the least, the blockchain will actually empower the decision maker. You and I will become the decision makers. You and I, people, individuals. Our decisions will be encoded in the, in the code and the validators, the computer systems, are going to validate our wish, our vision, our expectation. Uh, we are the individuals. So we could be in control of our own data. You know about GDPR, the Global Data Protection Regulation. That can actually become reality. It may be a hearsay for some people to think that GDPR cannot be implemented with blockchain, but uh, I would challenge them. GDPR can be absolutely implemented using the next generation of distributed computing. In fact, we can have so much data protection that uh, we really would be in control of our own destiny, our own data. So it has a game changing benefit. That's what the hype is all about. Let's talk about the energy blockchain, the use of blockchain in energy. This energy blockchain is actually a, a word that, that was coined by the Energy Blockchain Consortium in February this year. What does it do? It tracks energy assets or the use of, or the use thereof for the trading and the payment actually. So in other words, you can track an asset from the generation to consumption, whether it's electricity, water, gas, oil, anything. And the payments actually can be processed as well. You can do trading as well. From an from a uh, from the energy industry perspective, uh, some examples could be, for example, peer-to-peer -peer trading in a microgrid. Uh, but that's not that's only between a few parties. This technology can be used for wholesale energy trading as well on the ISO market. For example, ISO New England has about 450 or 550 participants, market participants. Those participants can work together using blockchain and expedite the execution of settlement. That's very powerful, actually. So there are many different opportunities in which uh, blockchain can be applied to the energy industry. It can be used actually both in the regulated and the, and the deregulated market, actually. There is a myth that it cannot work in the regulated market. We are developing use cases today for the regulated market, which is vertically oriented. So it's, 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 it's application is in both in the regulated and deregulated market. So one of the interesting things about the blockchain is you can have a permissioned blockchain or a permissionless blockchain. A permission blockchain is a blockchain which is a very controlled environment between known players. And it's perfect for utilities, oil and gas companies, regulators and policymakers who, who, don't, who don't care too much about the mass public market. They care about their region, their location. They care about a controlled demographic of users they care about their customers. 
the permission blockchain actually is a perfect model at least now today 2018 uh, for these companies there's a huge advantage a cheaper transaction lower latencies and there's higher control because there's less uh, nuances to manage so there's no need for is ico or cryptocurrency um, or relying on the exchanges or anonymous users and there is there is no danger i've heard i've re I've, I've i've heard the word danger there is no danger actually with the crypto with the cryptocurrency and there is a concept of immutability of smart contracts which means that hey if i implement a contract and i can't change it what if there are bugs in it actually that really happened in ethereum about a couple of years ago the immutability itself could be the achilles heel but it's also a great asset if used wisely and finally the proof of stake and the proof of authority are the consensus and the validation mechanisms more prominent in a permission blockchain why because we don't need these mining activities and the computer systems to tell us who the leader is we can appoint a few stakeholders and authorities as the leaders let them make a little bit of uh, uh, money we don't need to be able to waste the energy in the energy sector specifically so there are ways in which we can actually implement the pos and poa for consensus and achieve the level of validation for block building basically okay here are a set of use cases that uh, uh, that are viable viable for the energy market and i'm focused on this particular case on the electricity sector but we are also developing uh, use cases for the oil and gas industry so we have like uh, uh, use cases primarily for the electricity uh, on the page so these are things like one can do peer-to-peer -peer energy trading in a microgrid uh, i talked about the wholesale market settlement i the iso level for example um, the blockchain can also be used for managing the energy data so when you and i consumers and building owners are actually getting the data our bills all of that can be managed through blockchain uh, the forecasting uh, uh, what is the potential we need confidence in the data and the forecasting and blockchain is a perfect example for forecasting and even measurement and verification the whole concept of net energy metering where you have the prosumers producing electricity and pumping it back into the grid requires a level of control otherwise there will be uh, dissonance in the main grid so there's stuff that's happening on the edge of the grid which is off the grid that has huge implications on the traditional grid so we need to be able to use the blockchain in a smart way to be able to manage and throttle and balance the power between the microgrid and the main grid and that is all possible through the blockchain when you have multiple uh, distributed energy resources plugged on the edge of the grid think of what can happen we can have a lot of power all of a sudden the wind blew boom pff, we have a lot of power or there's a solar power that gets generated that has a huge impact on the main grid so what is happening on the edge of the grid impacts the main grid so there's a level of service coordination that we have to do so i'm not going to go into all the details but uh, there's grid security there are use cases around customer data service retail billing ev charging uh, energy storage microgrid rec and carbon trading we have been hearing that a lot and there is also an opportunity for transactive energy where price responsive demand response can actually drive a lot of the capability that we've been waiting for so these are some of the use cases that we are developing right now if anybody's interested uh, we can get you plugged in okay so here is an example of an actual use case uh, which talks about the energy trading so in this particular use case uh, we've used transactive energy which is the injection of price signals into the microgrid and how those price signals can be used by the prosumers to make either decisions proactively or the price signals can help the prosumers and the consumer the prosumers the producers and the consumers also the prosumers prosumers to be able to buy and sell 
So for example, in this particular use case, a, the energy market, the price signal from the energy market is injected into the blockchain. Uh, that blockchain has producers and consumers as identified by two and three. The producers produce electricity, pump into the microgrid, the consumers consume electricity from the grid. And the consumers can actually place orders as well with pre-negotiated prices or they can buy it on the exchange. But the goal here is that the, uh, the, 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 the energy is produced and it's actually consumed through the solar and the battery, for example. Uh, the utility has a huge role to play. The, the utility has a, has, a, has a way to be able to remove the kilowatt hours from the producers into the grid if it's, that's needed. Somebody has to balance the grid. The operators can actually balance the grid. They manage the load, frequency, and the power factor. That's number five. And number six, the smart contract. Somebody has to say, aha, I know all the energy, electricity that came in, or I know all the electricity that went out. We need to do all the math and come up with the right model for smart contract. So that is encoded in the contract itself. And there's billing and settlement that goes with it. And the seven is a proof of, proof of authority, which is the confirmation. That proof of authority could be the utility. As opposed to it being a minor, uh, it could be in a, a, a proof of authority as opposed to proof of proof of work with a minor, it could be proof of authority or even proof of stake, basically. So this is a, this is a very interesting example. It's not fully uh, uh, shown because it's a little bit more complex than this, but this is an illustration that gets, gets you a sense that how we can use blockchain in the energy market, in this case, the utility market, and apply that for a particular use case, which is peer-to-peer -peer trading with transactive energy price signals going from the energy market into the blockchain. Okay, now comes the potential in the energy industry. What is the potential of blockchain? We all know that the entire power grid is going through a massive transformation. It started with the a smart grid and there was a catalyst of the ARRA grant in 2008 2009 we know that the grid is going to change from a single direction from generation transmission distribution to a bi-directional grid where the comp the energy is flowing from the consumers back into the grid which is totally different we also know that the DERs are coming online, distributed energy resources are coming online. So the whole world is changing with the EVs, the storage, the price of storage is gonna come down significantly over the next three years. With all of that massive transformation happening in the industry, now comes blockchain. Coincidentally, blockchain is here. Just imagine what will happen with this technology when we have the ability to actually make all of this happen, what you see on the left side, actually make it happen from a transaction perspective. What you're gonna witness is an accelerated disruption, not just transformation, but an accelerated disruption. So there are a few things that I wanted to put on paper so you know that I didn't miss out on them. Um, they are not that relevant for today's presentation, but just to look into a digital wallet, which is a global bank account. What is a hash function? Look into that. It's a software algorithm to map data to any size. Uh, think about, just look into the top five or six uh, 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 platforms for, for blockchain. It's Bitcoin and BTC, Ethereum, Ripple. Uh, and also look into some of these, uh, these blockchains, how they're evolving. But I wanted to have this sheet in front of you so you know some of the terms. ICO is something that you will hear a lot about. It's the initial coin offering, actually, which is uh, the way these startups are starting to get traction. So I'm on the last few seconds. Uh, what's next? Uh, if you have any questions or ideas, contact me. Um, you can go to the Energy Blockchain uh, uh, and register for other webinars. Uh, I would welcome you to join the, uh, the consortium as part of this journey. I would strongly recommend to not do it alone. Work with your peers and partners and manage this disruption in a very smart way. And I would love you to get involved in many of the projects that we are working on. Thank you so much uh, for your attention. Irfan? Yes, thank you very much. And we have a set of questions uh, that we would like to get to right away. 
We have about 15 minutes, but I think given the number of questions, we may have to go another extra 10 minutes to do justice to all of these questions. Okay. All right. So the first question is, we got to go up a little higher. The first question is, would you please explain further what you mean by hijacking the system? This is from Carol Di Benedetto. Okay. So basically, um, if you look into a traditional model of how computer systems work today and how companies operate these computer systems, we as citizens, our people are relying on a faith of how companies operate and their computer systems. And we were not very impressed in 2007, 2008 when the financial crisis happened. So there are a lot of ways in which things can go wrong. What I mean by hijacking, hijacking is that if that concept of encoding can be embedded in a computer system where that isn't possible, that brings a unique opportunity that we will not have an environment where a company or a computer system can actually hijack the, the data or the information or the need of the users. That whole trust that we have in companies, it's important, we know that, but if we could encode that trust in something, somebody, somehow, wouldn't that be interesting? Blockchain is actually that thing. We can encode our trust in a smart contract. And the blockchain technology guarantees that those transactions will be implemented and cannot be changed. And therefore, the concept of immu immutability, which is don't change anything, is important. And that's where that's why I believe that uh, the hijacking is not possible. Again, there are ways in which rogue actors can exist, but what I've seen over the last two years is that the blockchains are becoming robust year after year, and they're almost becoming a good system. I won't say a perfect system, they're becoming better and better over time, and which makes it difficult to hijack these systems for personal gain or uh, a personal need. The next question is, the initials are WF, and he asks, doesn't POA break the decentralization principle? Um, no, not, not in a way, because we have identified that there are two types of blockchains, a private and a public. When you, I, when you call something private blockchain, by definition, you are submitting to the principles of privacy of having only a certain number of players who are participating in that blockchain. By definition of the rules of the game, you are nominating a certain authorities. So in a perfect world, you would nominate those authorities or the leaders based upon some logic, some reasoning. And that's why the proof of authority is becoming popular because many of the utilities that I've spoken to and the oil and gas companies I've spoken to, they will not implement a permissionless blockchain. They will only impl implement a permission-based blockchain. And that's why that need is, uh, is important. Uh, just a logistical point. Uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation will be converted into PDF and everyone who registered will receive a copy. And when we are able to upload the recording into YouTube, we'll provide you a link so you can go and watch it on YouTube. Now, Dale Bradshaw gives you a compliment. He says, thanks. This is the best presentation I have sat in on blockchain. Thank you. I appreciate the kind comment. Don Jenkins says, won't blockchain slow the system down? The transaction should no longer be in milliseconds, but in seconds and possibly minutes, since you have to wait until it is validated and then propagated out to all nodes before the transaction is considered valid? 
So what's the question? Won't blockchain slow the system down? Okay, good question. Blockchain is the distributed technology that is designed to scale over time. When you have a certain number of transactions and you have a transaction processing environment like a bank has or a, or a telephone company has, those systems require high throughput. I'm talking about, I used to run transactions like you know, 5,000 transactions a second. They call them TPS, 5,000 transactions per second, 10,000 transactions per second. The blockchain of today is not able to sustain that throughput today. Why? Because if you look into the, the POW, the public blockchain, it basically creates a block every 10 minutes. But if you look into the private blockchains, you can actually create a block in seconds, uh, or milliseconds. So the moral of the story is that the blockchains are improving their consensus building algorithms and improving the capability to record transactions faster, quicker, cheaper, and the creation of the block will also try uh, be faster, quicker, and cheaper over time, basically. Yeah, and this is where it becomes very important to do use case analysis and then go shopping in the industry to see best of breed. And when it fits, then use it. Correct. Next, uh, from Driss Benhadu, he asks, how much does it cost to establish an entity that verifies a transaction? That's a, that's a good question. Um, uh, if you're talking about, I believe you're talking about the, the proof of work, basically. So just to give you a sense, the proof of work has become such a popular way to uh, do the creation of the blocks that companies have set up uh, computer centers in uh, countries like India and China and other com other countries where uh, where they can have massive computing power and resources working in a data center. Again, there are many such establishments also in the U.S. So having, I mean, you can have a little computer that allows you to process the data but you can also have hundreds and hundreds of computers that do the mining of the of the data. Um, it could take a few thousand dollars to millions of dollars, but it's a, it's a well-known field actually now, which is called the data mining, uh, which is the mining of the Bitcoins. And uh, uh, to give you a sense, a Bitcoin actually has a puzzle called Hashcash. Uh, and the complexity of the puzzle, uh, note what I'm saying, the complexity of the puzzle actually keeps on increasing as the computing power increases. Can you believe it? So you can come up with a computer system with a million dollar and all of a sudden the computing capacity would increase over time and then you need more computers. So, so you have to go into this knowing that you may be prepared to add more computing power if you need to solve the puzzle. In this case, the hash cache function or the hash function. So, it's a very relative answer. I can't really give you an answer except that nowadays it costs thousands and thousands, maybe millions of dollars. Yes, uh, between the liberalization of marijuana laws and blockchain and Bitcoin, uh, I think the duck curve problem will be solved very nicely and it'll, the duck will become nice and fat in the middle of the day. Interesting point, Irfan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Dale Bradshaw asked, what is ICO? But I saw that you showed it in the sl slide towards the end, but you could mention it again if you like. Sure, initial coin offering is an offering that a startup would potentially do to tell the world that here, here is, I am, I exist, uh, I have a white paper, I intend to solve this problem. So please, can you go give me money so that I can build my company? Uh, traditionally, you would go to an angel investor or a venture capitalist to ask for a few hundred thousand or a million dollar, but now you can do it through an ICO. So all of a sudden, SEC, which is in the United States, says that we need to be very careful about how we are raising capital. So the ICO is the model by which people are raising capital. There are more tighter restrictions in the U.S. Uh, North American market. Uh, in the European market, it's relatively a little bit different. The economic climate is different. But that's the model that startups are, or small companies are using to raise capital. And people have raised all the way from a few hundred thousand dollars to millions of dollars, maybe a billion as well. Yeah, one interesting thing is uh, trying to line up the computation for this application with the availability of renewable energy in a 
a comprehensive demand response program so that the carbon footprint of Bitcoin and cryptography, this cryptocurrency is kept to a minimum and blockchain. So have you thought about that at all? Uh, are you asking me, Arfan? Yes. Um, repeat the question again. I was, I think, I thought you were making a comment. Can you repeat your question again? Yeah, the, the question is that, you know, this computation requires energy. And right. the amount of energy that will be needed will keep growing as you were talking about the complexity. So are there any initiat uh, initiatives that align the energy need for computation with the presence of renewable energy so that the carbon footprint of uh, blockchain is kept to a minimum? That's a fantastic question, um, uh, Irfan. Uh, I believe that given the, uh, given the uh, uh, compounding need for energy to do these intense computations, um, again, I, the, the amount of energy that's consumed per year is what what the country where the, of Denmark uses. So I think that the problem here is that that uh, we need to use the renewables to power our data centers uh, to do the blockchain uh, mining. And in this particular case, there are already some efforts that I'm aware of where uh, the injection of renewables and the DERs and the solar and uh, battery are going to provide some of that uh, transformation. And we are actually starting to hear that a lot over the last six months. Yeah, what I worry about is that there may be bait and switch where the data center may claim I'm getting my energy from renewable energy, but find out over long periods of time that it's some natural gas distributed generation unit that's actually providing the kilowatt hours, even though the kilowatts are advertised from renewable energy. That's correct, yeah. Because it requires a steady source of energy. So we need to combine this with a comprehensive demand response program that can take advantage of the geographical diversity of renewable energy and bring those electrons selectively over natural gas kind of things, because that defeats the purpose of trying to reduce carbon if we're going to end up using a lot more natural gas to do this. Absolutely, and that's sort of the the quagmire of we as the in the energy industry are experiencing the quagmire of we being the energy uh, industry um, are responsible for the uh, for the care and upkeep of producing renewable energy, uh, and therefore we can't really spend more energy than we are actually producing through the greener means. So I think this is something that the industry has to address uh, more. Uh, more appropriately, uh, but I think there are efforts underway uh, which are very reasonable. But I think eventually, if we decide to go with a POW, which is actually a very important algorithm, and I can talk about that, uh, why that's the case. But because of that need alone, the POW is an important algorithm and it will be computer intensive. So we have to think ways to address that. Well, you have given me renewed motivation to accelerate my work on generation four small modular nuclear reactors to do this stuff. Okay, so, so if, you. You don't, if you don't go home on time, then don't uh, have your family blame me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, next question from Mike Marullo. Uh, what is the likelihood, if any, of Bitcoin eventually, or sorry, blockchain, eventually being used in real time apps such as CADA process control as a security measure in a private uh, blockchain environment? That's a very good uh, question, Mike. Um, I believe that uh, the integration of IT and OT is uh, very critical for the success of the industry that we are in right now. And that integration between the SCADA, OT, and the IT will require a better technology because today we are faced with an imminent danger of having a lot of variability and dissonance on the edge of the grid, which means that the devices we are deploying and the technology we are deploying at the edge of the grid makes the grid weaker. What that means is that any weak link in the larger grid is going to be the point of vulnerability for the larger grid, and which means the SCADA is could be under attack. So the answer is that we need to make sure that both the edge of the grid and within the grid, so outside the grid on the edge and within the grid, we can deploy better technology, a better distributed computing technology 
and that better distributed computing technology is blockchain. Um, uh, why I say that? Because blockchain has evolved from the OSF DCE to CORBA, Common Object Request Broker Architecture, to J2EE, to, uh, uh, to SOA. So blockchain is nothing new in the evolutionary path for the computer people that are amongst us. It's a very logical next step in my mind, very, very logical next step. It's nothing to fear actually. So the application of blockchain in the IT is going to be pervasive and the integration of IT and OT will become a norm five, six, seven, eight years from now. And it's going to happen basically is my point. Yes, I think one of the things to emphasize is that these advanced technologies don't replace common sense of having segmentation of the network and having a layered defense model. Once you have that layered defense cybersecurity architecture, then you can introduce uh, this blockchain technology into it in a responsible way. But if your network is chaotic, then this will only add to the complexity and the security problem. So it's very important. In the same way in transactive energy, we find that while microeconomic theory is good in the between balancing between supply and demand, but you can't forget control theory to make sure that the grid is reliable. And you made that point earlier in your presentation. So we don't, we shouldn't forget common sense and physics and engineering principles when we look at these things. These are add-ons, they're not the replacement for those things. Excellent, yeah, absolutely right. Okay, now Carl, uh, Carol Di Benedetto asks, is the Energy Blockchain Consortium or others working on use cases for regulated carbon markets? Yes, we are working on that, uh, definitely. We are working on an REC use case and the uh, GHG emission, yes. Good. Mike Marullo asks, uh, doesn't appointing a leader start back down a path to monopolization? No, it does not because the leader is appointed through democratization actually, not through, uh, not through any other approach but democratization. And the rules of engagement are defined up front when you create the blockchain. So therefore, by definition, we are, it's, it's like when we appoint our leaders, we do them through a democratic process. How they turn out to be is basically something that we have, we, we, we may question ourselves. But when we do that, we have the ability to be, to make a change in blockchain. I don't know how that impacts the real world, but within blockchain, we have the ability as a democratic system to uh, manage the changes. Uh, that's why the blockchain is such a beautiful machine actually. So on a humorous note, is uh, foreign government intervention possible in the election of the leader in blockchain? Uh, see, blockchain is, is, is a computer system uh, that, uh, pro that keeps data and manages data and executes transaction. Uh, it is, nothing is bulletproof, but it is as bulletproof as we as a humanity has designed it to be right now. We are, blockchain is the most robust computer system designed as of now. It precedes the service oriented architecture. It precedes common object request broker architecture. It precedes OSF DCE. It precedes J2EE, which means it is the next generation of distributed computing that is more powerful, more secure, more decentralized, and provide better security of data and individuals basically. Yeah, what I uh, found very interesting in your presentation is the dependence on technology because by doing that, you are uh, filling the gap between industrialized societies and developing nations since computation is something that is available all over the world. And this could be a levelizer uh, for having a, the same level of security in a developing country in a transaction as you do in an industrialized society. So I thought that was pretty disruptive. Definitely. Uh, and I think when we encode our morality in a machine, it helps actually. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I think uh, Mr. Spock is going to become popular again. Uh, the uh, next question from WF, the blockchain may be secure, but the data going into it can be flawed. So all use cases can still have the same issues we have today with trust. How is this not the case? 
Okay, I'll tell you, I'll give you a precise example. Um, the data that goes into the system is basically can be rejected through some well-defined smart smart contract. So let's say that uh, Andy sold uh, a one widget to Bob. Uh, that If that's a fact, the computer system takes it. If that's not a fact, then it rejects it. Uh, but the fact that Bob owns owes a dollar for that one widget to Andy is encoded in the machine. So the, now, now that now that Andy has given one widget to Bob, the transaction has occurred. The goods have been exchanged, and there is a track, uh, there is a tracking of that. That one step milestone is done. The second milestone, which is the giving of the money and the calculation of it, is basically the next step. So nobody can break that. Why? Because it's encoded in the smart contract. The logic says number of units time dollar amount is equal to the payment amount. So, so the the so we are as good as we can make the machine to be basically and and the beauty of the machine is not just the fact that it can do this computation we, that's not rocket science because that's been happening for the last let's say 100 years or 80 years the rocket science is how we've taken the encoding spread it out in hundreds and maybe hundreds and thousands of computers make them smart and we actually have an ecosystem where things can fall apart. You know, a bunch of computer systems can stop. They could be, the fault tolerance is built into it, basically. That fault tolerance is basically the BFT I told you about. The Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantium military strategy, which is that some generals will be rogue generals. How do you get this information from multiple nodes? And those multiple nodes are saying that node B is not working, but node D says B is working. Now you have a situation where multiple generals are saying that node B is good, or the other general says node B is bad. How do you deal with that? Can you even imagine how you deal with that? That complexity of managing a complex network is basically the rocket science with the blockchain. So I just wanted to say that yeah. because I think it's the, it's the way it works that is the beauty of it. Yes, and there is something called the Delphi method that is used in the Byzantine general uh, model, where uh, a certain percentage, if agree, then that's considered the truth and the minority is rejected. And uh, by sharing it with everyone, uh, you find out the rogue one very quickly. So the, it's uh, using a concept of a facilitator and you can share uh, the results in order to ensure integrity. But to the point that is being made here, please don't forget that blockchain does not replace deep packet inspection. Blockchain does not uh, replace monitoring the insider threat by doing context-based intrusion detection. So when you do all of those things, then the blockchain works really well because from the point of data egress out of uh, company A, then you have a trusted chain of command all the way to when you get it. But how the data is created still has to be observed within the company that generated the data. So it's not replacing that. And that's how you get the integrity of the data. Very well explained. Uh, okay. Very well explained, yeah. Let's uh, continue because the questions keep coming. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they are uh, really enjoying this interaction here. Okay, Bruce Rosenthal asks, are there mechanisms to flag block elements in terms of data classification levels so blocks and chains can be handled by different distributed processes depending on those classification levels? Say we want blocks with restricted confidential DII or HIPAA elements handled more rigorously than blocks with less restricted data elements. What a beautiful question this is. Um, um, I'll try to give you the answer. Based upon the GDPR, which is a newer standard that went into force on May 25th, uh, uh, we as a society have decided that we're going to protect the individual's rights, which requires the companies to do that, otherwise they are fined. In order for them to do that, they have to do data classification of what data is uh, PII data, what is secure data, what is not secure data. And in that classification, they have to identify and probably encrypt and secure the data. 
So uh, uh, with that thought process as the context, let's see how that applies to the blockchain. In the blockchain, the physical manifestation of the data is sitting in the, in the ledger itself. If we can encode the smart contract that says that such and such data will be considered privileged and such and such data will be uh, not privileged, that is a, nothing more than a simple algorithm and it can be facilitated. The actual act of encryption is important, but not that important because all the data is hashed anyway. So there is a concept of transaction oversight and encryption and uh, hashing built into it. The key question, therefore, is can different nodes execute different processes and transactions? Now, that is a key question that I don't have a very good answer to. The only answer I can give is that multiple nodes within blockchain uh, can participate in doing the validation and the validation itself is can can happen on alternate nodes so there are ways in which we can design a blockchain with the encoding built into it that precludes some of the nodes in processing the some of the data but the problem here is that the problem why that just may be contrary to the the thesis of blockchain is that by definition every node should have a copy so if every node does not have a copy then basically we are breaking the ground rules. So then let's go back to the question that we asked. What is the motivation for that? So in other words, every solution that every thought process that emerges must be based upon a problem. So what is the problem? Is the can the, the can the person who's questioning this can can you can you give me your thought process while I move on to the next question, Irfan? Okay. So uh and it's 12 after 11 here at Mountain Time, so we should wrap up in the next 10 minutes, no more than that. And okay. then the rest of the questions can be emailed to you and you can respond to them directly. Okay. Uh, do use cases, this is Philip Mullins asking, do use cases require discrete infrastructure or can you run multiple use cases over a common platform? You can run multiple use cases on the common platform. It all depends upon the smart contract, how you encode it. Very good. Moving along, uh, the next question is from Dixon Wright, who asks, how do data standards like the DOE green and orange button XBRL get incorporated in blockchain transactions for energy data? That's a very good question, actually. So typically, the, the green button initiative means that I can get uh, interval data from utilities uh, whenever and I, I ask for it. So that flow of data can be injected into the blockchain and memorialized forever. So that's basically a very, uh, uh, let me use the word simple. Uh, it's a simple concept conceptually to pull that data. Uh, so that data that flows into the system becomes a transaction. And that transaction requires some level of uh, validation. And if we create a smart contract that validates the data that this is John Smith's data residing on 123 Main Street, then we can do the encoding to inject that data into the blockchain. And it doesn't need to be a one-step process. This could be an ongoing effort to injecting those uh, the stream of uh, green button data, basically. And that could be true for the blue button from a healthcare industry perspective as well. So yeah, answer is yes, it's doable. Dale Bradshaw asks, what is PNC? PNC, is it a, I don't know, PNC, I didn't use that acronym. Okay, um, next, uh, I think somewhere you just uh, abbreviated it and called it PNC, I, I did recall. But, oh, I think it has to do with prosumers and consumers. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, P and C, I thought P and C, yeah. uh, Peter and Nancy. Uh, Peter, yeah, P and C, PNC. yeah. <laughs> okay, so P is, the, P, P is the producer of electricity, uh, yeah. and C is the consumer of electricity. So that's yeah. why a P can also be used for a prosumer, which is both a producer and a consumer of electricity. Typically, we use that Correct. word for a microgrid when you have people like you and I with a solar panel on a rooftop and a, a battery storage. We are both producers and we are consumers. Rita Erickson of WAPA asks, you mentioned uh, case studies. Where can we find some of these for review? Um, they will have to join the Energy Blockchain Consortium. 
Okay. Scott Dinage asked, uh, the hijacking question was pertaining to 51% attacks as was listed in one of the slides. That is correct, actually. Uh, that is a that is the uh, uh, that is a paradox uh, that we are in right now. That when you have the proof of work algorithm, then you will have a small chance, which is if a user has 51% of the resources, then that user can hijack. In other words, they can make a decision, and that could be a completely a rogue decision. So anytime you have a public blockchain with one entity owning more than 51% and having the computing resources, that could become a threat to the blockchain. So to give you an example, uh, 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 there are some blockchains and famous uh, uh, founders of blockchain who do not own more than 4.5% of the tokens. So even though a blockchain may be worth $73 billion, they own only 4.5% of the token. What, what means is that even they cannot, in their almightiness, uh, uh, hijack the blockchain that they invented. So it's a fairly f foolproof system, but I wanted to mention that because that's one of the flaws. Hayo Jang Li asks, is energy blockchain applicable in real-time applications? Of course, of course. Uh, we, are, we gave you an example where transactive energy which is the whole concept of transactive energy is to inject real-time price signals in the decision making of people like you and i and companies who are around us the very concept of that price signal injection into a let's say a, uh, a let's say into a private to a blockchain will give you a a, a, a sub-second response time so yes it's possible to use transactive energy price signals into a blockchain with an exchange that does are trading in real time. Very good. Mohammed Samir Zaveri asks, would you kindly explain that this energy blockchain will target the public blockchain or private blockchain in the long run? I think I think in the beginning, in the early days of blockchain in 2018, I anticipate in the beginning there may be more practical uses of the private blockchain or the permissioned blockchain because it brings a less uh, complex ecosystem um, to deal with. Uh, but I think over time, the way you and I have access to the internet, and we are connected through a firewall to the larger world, that model will start to appear over five, seven, eight, nine years. Uh, but we start with a private or permission blockchain and then the world will evolve actually. Uh, I'm talking about the utility and the oil and gas industry because that's what I'm hearing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there are pockets of implementations on a public blockchain with the transactions of uh, uh, cryptocurrency happening. That is actually happening today. Uh, so uh, when I talk about this, uh, uh, I want to show, I want to be very practical about how it's going to be rolled out. And that's the strategy that I'm seeing unfolding for the next one, two years, if you will. Yeah, anything that can do away with PKI and X509 certificates and the whole idea of distributed key management, I'm on board. <laughs> I think with your expertise, <laughs> your fun, uh, we'll have to make sure that the usage of blockchain is within a secure environment. Otherwise, it's going to break the very norm of why we are using it, you know? Yes. Uh, having been in operations, I know how difficult it is to replace a compromise key. So while it may look very simple on a PowerPoint, when you try to do it over a geographically distributed network, it is tough business. And then try to combine that with smart meters and prayer is necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, said. <laughs> rightly said, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Next is uh, Scott Dinich. He says he did not explain how consensus is maintained. And then he said forking, extra, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. I, I want, yes, I, there was a little bit of a complex algorithm. What happens is that I think what Dinesh is talking about is that let's say that we appoint two, uh, there are leaders who are working on, a, on, on the blockchain. And all of a sudden, there are two leaders who say, aha, I'm going to look into block one, two, three. And they all come up with, creating a block one, two, three, but guess what? Block one, two, three is already created uh, or is created by, by the first leader. Then what do we do? Then there's a concept of forking that comes into play. 
So for a, for a small amount of time, there are two blocks which are created. And uh, the world has to live with that for a short period of minutes. And then what happens is the block one, two, three, and the not a valid block one, two, three prime, uh, again fork into the next level. And then they again fork into the next level. Imagine that's happening for 30, 30 minutes. Uh, there is a built-in um, self-healing that occurs. I'm using that word from my uh, my utility uh, background. Uh, it's not a blockchain word, but uh, there's a self-healing that occurs that auto-corrects that uh, anomaly, and the world goes back to the proper functioning of uh, the block, and the block gets uh, certified. So uh, there are three levels to how that danger can be propagated or that anomaly can be propagated. But there's a self-healing that brings it back to correction in after the three levels, basically. And that's a complex algorithm that is beyond the scope of today's discussion, but that's how it works. Okay, now we'll continue uh, for a few more minutes and then I'll send you the remaining questions. Okay. Because we're running way over time. Uh, next question is from Amar Badmanabha who asks, will quantum computing undermine the immutability of blockchain in the near future? Will quantum computing undermine the immutability of blockchain in the future? Yes. How, how so? I have a little bit of an idea what a quantum computing and how that's applied to the security as well. But I don't think so. Well, I, I think what he's talking about is the dramatic increase in the ability to compute and undermine the complexity of uh, blockchain? Uh, that could be a temporary glitch in the world we live in because uh, uh, if we use the proof of work, but if we decide to create a permission network, um, the, the, the consensus building algorithms uh, will have enough capacity to take uh, sub-second decisions, very similar to a transaction processing environment where you have hundreds and hundreds of people going to an ATM and withdrawing money. The ATM never tells us that, hey, buddy, come back in 10 minutes. I don't have time to give you money right now. That will be foolhardy and stupid. So the transaction processing on the back end uh, provides the ability to have high throughput. Blockchain, basically, uh, the, the smart contract on the blockchain is not as perfect as an OLTP transaction processing machine as yet i think it's getting there but the amount of computing power that's required to achieve that uh, is is starting to uh, uh, provide that level of uh, tps throughput that we're looking for next question from yang feng ku who asked blockchain can handle which problems current system cannot address uh, think about a, a transaction where you need to have a two different users who want to buy and sell very simple thing, 101, right? Today we can actually do that, uh, but there'll be a lot of overhead, of, even for the REC, for example. For the REC, you have a 15% overhead on the trade of an REC. With blockchain, you reduce that to a micro amount, less than 1% of the overhead. So the first, you, first set of use cases will reduce the overhead. The second set of use cases are going to uh, create the disruption, which is to create things that you and I haven't even thought about. You and I never knew the Amazon will exist in 1950 or 60 or 70. We never knew Facebook will exist. Uh, so these are new applications uh, that would be developed uh, uh, as the blockchain evolves. But right now, we are limited by our understanding of these 18 use cases I gave you. And I have a list of another 50. Um, but these are the 30 or 50 use cases that will provide efficiencies, improved processing, and higher throughput, uh, basically. So some things we cannot do today, uh, like for example, net energy metering. A net energy metering has caused, caused a lot of problems. For example, in Hawaii, when the excessive production of energy in the households uh, provided uh, instability uh, in the Hawaii electric grid. Uh, and that required a moratorium on Hawaiian electric to tell the residents not to pump energy. All of that complexity could be automated and we can use the balancing uh, authorities to balance the grid as the energy is being produced. So all of those things could be managed which are not doable today. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna bring this uh, presentation to an end. 
the questions I will save and what we will do is I will have Tony respond to them and we'll create a document and send it along with the uh, presentation. So this way, everyone will feel like their question got answered and everyone will get the benefit of the answers from Tony. So thank you very much. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we have provided you a schedule of our remaining webinars. Uh, they're going to continue July, August, September, and onwards. It will always be on the first Friday at this time. Uh, do you want to have any parting comments, uh, Tony, before we bring this presentation to a close? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Irfan, for, uh, uh, for shepherding this. I appreciate your time and your patience. And I also want to thank uh, the participants uh, who have asked some fantastic questions. Uh, there is no question that is wrong. So actually, I enjoy this. This is what I really like. So if you guys have any questions that you want to send to me, uh, send it through email is right in front of you. And I want to thank you again for your time. And I look forward to uh, another presentation in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. So at this time, I'm going to bring the recording to a close. And I appreciate all your participation. We had over 180 people at the peak. So the participation level was extremely high. And I thank you for your interest. Uh, Enjoy your weekend, and we'll be in touch very soon. Have a good day. Thank you.